Tampa Bay's business address is Money Talk 1010 AM and available on HD at 99.5 HD2. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Money Talk 1010 AM, Tampa Bay's business address. The views and opinions expressed on the following show are those of Morgan Streetman and are not those of Beasley Media Group, this station, its management, or other hosts or advertisers. On Money Talk 1010 AM, it's the Morgan Streetman Show. Morgan and Roxanne Wilder are discussing everything from world, national, and local issues to information from the unknown, and since Morgan's an attorney, there will probably be a little something from the law. Now, here are Morgan Streetman and Roxanne Wilder. Well, hello, everybody. So good to have a studio audience in here today. Not only Morgan Streetman, the host, the star of the show. <laughs> I'm Roxanne Wilder, Pat George, and two lovely ladies. You, you know what's funny is last week we said, say hi to Mama. And well, look you, what it did. It brought her right here to the front door. You, gave, you told me to give her a shout out. Now, here she is. Right and here, yeah. we have another very special guest. An intern. That's right. Right. Our youngest a future intern radio is here. star. What is our intern's name? Cordelia. Cordelia, my beautiful niece, Cordelia. That's such a pretty name. Isn't that a pretty mm-hmm. name? Mm-hmm. I know. First one I ever met. Yeah. Well, it's one of those names you just don't hear that much Absolutely anymore. Absolutely not. But it's a beautiful name. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're, you know, so- we're trying to pick baby, baby names in my household. My sister's having another baby, and she was sold on one name, and she's gotten, she's due in a month, and she's gotten all these different, you know, shirts for the for the grandfather, and and so she decided yesterday that they decided they don't like that name. They picked out the oh. name Bria, so they're looking for a new name. They p- picked out Bria, mm-hmm. uh-huh. but now Bria's scratched. Bria's so off. They need now. a new one. Okay. Text over Cordelia. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest it's a Cordelia. Good one. It is. It's a really mm-hmm. good one. Yeah character from william shakespeare's king lear there you go mm-hmm. there you go yes so. well and we're so pleased to have a studio audience because we don't always get one we know we've got an audience at home and at work and in the car mm-hmm. and of course if any of y'all want to get on the horn with us today we'd be happy to hear from you the number to call is 888-404-1010 mm-hmm. if you have a question or a comment or really anything at all that you might want to say we'd be happy to hear from you Got a lot of stories going on. You know, take a quick look back at one that we've talked to you about a number of times, and that is the Tommy Robinson story. And if you'll remember, Tommy Robinson was the um, UK guy, the guy over in England, who was basically trying to bring attention to these Muslim grooming gangs Mm -hmm. that are victimizing um, children in Britain. And so he was trying to bring attention to this problem. And the end result of that is the U.K. government arrested him, tried him, convicted him, didn't even give him his own lawyer, tried him and convicted him and shipped him off to jail all on the same day. So the same day they arrested him, they threw him into jail for 13 months. That's pretty egregious, particularly when you look at how they treat actual criminals in the U.K., who they barely do anything to. And it, this this judge who made that decision is getting a lot a lot of flack, rightfully so. And you kind of look into his past and wonder how he was able to rise to where he did. So he he's getting a lot of hate online and and probably in the real world. Well, like you say, rightfully so, because it just doesn't make a lick of sense. And I'll tell you, the people, the British people, the English people, by and large, are appears to me to be on the side of Tommy Robinson. It's the elites, it's the rulers, it's the leadership in the country that's trying to force on the people an acceptance of Muslim Sharia. Mm -hmm. Now, Tommy Robinson's been fighting Sharia law in Britain for years, and he's very well known for it. So this is the result of that campaign. The reason that he's targeted for enforcement is to quiet people down, to create a chilling effect. Because as we know in our own country, if there's one group that you're not allowed to criticize, it's the Muslims. And you start criticizing the Muslims, and all kinds of names start getting flung at you from racist to Islamophobe, all kinds of things that aren't even true. We're just pointing out facts, just pointing out facts, and just looking around and recognizing reality for what it is and not living in a made-up fairy tale inside of our own heads. And that's all Tommy Robinson was trying to do over there in Britain. And what is that line from the book 1984? It says, in a time of universal deceit, 
telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And isn't that exactly what we're seeing here? Mm -hmm. It is a time of universal deceit in England. They refuse to acknowledge reality. So when Tommy Robinson comes along and he says, this is reality, I'm going to tell you the truth. Just covering an event, essentially. They throw him in jail and issue a gag order that says that the papers can't even report on the fact that they've jailed him. Now, if that's not a police state, I mean, I'm I'm serious. I mean, this... (laughs) I mean, what in the heck is going on in Britain, in England? I mean, you've got an English guy who believes in English values, a working class guy, Tommy Robinson, and then you've got all these people that they've brought in from these other countries that don't share values with English people, largely, or at least in part. And why is the leadership siding with those those people, the different people who are coming in to change England and make it into a Muslim state? where Sharia law is dominant, is at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. What do you think the queen thinks about all this? That's a good question, Pat. You know, unfortunately, the queen probably won't ever say, because that's the way that she fulfills her office, is that she really doesn't take... Stays out of it. Yeah, she doesn't take political positions. And over the long term, that's probably smart, because it maintains the monarchy as being above the fray. And when I say smart, I'm saying from her perspective, I'm not weighing in on whether the monarchy is a good thing or a bad thing we're not we're not deciding that right now but my gut would be that the queen of england is pretty darn conservative and she believes in english values so my gut would be that the queen of england would be pretty unhappy with what's happening to england and she keeps letting this go she could be one day setting in the alamo well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all around her, she's falling know, apart. I, I think she probably realizes if anybody winds up sitting in the Alamo, it's going to be Prince Charles or one of the one of the other children. You know, on mm-hmm. down the line. I mean, she's going to going to wind up um, probably abdicating before that happens. Queen wouldn't be queen if she was born in another country. That's in, right. Well, really, many other countries. Well, but then the other thing we have to remember about the monarchy is they're one of they're, they're essentially globalists. You know, they have an mm-hmm. international scope of their business and financial interests. And so largely they are probably aligned with the interests of the other large international financial True. interests, which is a move away from national sovereignty towards globalism. So they may in part think it's a bit of a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I've got to think as somebody who truly uh, believes in England and, and I, you know, I used to be a real Anglophile, a person who loved all the English stuff. I, I was really into all the English stuff. Um, if you, you speak know, with an English accent around your home, does that qualify you? <laughs> I'd, I'd say I so. If you put on a fake English accent while you're For at fun. home, mm-hmm. just because you like the way it sounds, then you're probably an Anglophile. If you like Downton Abbey, are you an Anglophile? <laughs> yes. And yes. <laughs> I remember one of the first things you ever talked about on the show was getting up on your soapbox like they did in England. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's, That's right. right. In Speaker's Corner. So, and speaking of soapboxes and Speaker's Corner, because we don't want to miss the reason that we're actually bringing up this Tommy Robinson stuff, is you got to go out there, folks, and watch the video of Geert Wilder's speech in London, because for some reason they actually let him into the country this time. You remember last time he tried to go to Britain, they mm-hmm. turned him away. Mm-hmm. This time they said, what's your business here, sir? And he says, I'm going to a protest march in, in uh, support of Tommy Robinson. And they let him in. And he went to the march, and he and he gave a speech. Now... You know, I would say Geert Wilders is not the world's greatest orator, but it's worth watching the speech. You have to remember it's not in his first language, you know, although he does speak English extremely well, um, but he is Dutch. And so, um, you know, his delivery, I'd say, leaves maybe a little something to be desired in terms of, of you know, the fervor which, with which he could be speaking. But the words that he's saying are really fantastic. And it really comes down to freedom, freedom of thought freedom of opinion and he's focusing on the fact that they've lost that in england and tommy robinson is the first example you know the the top example i don't mean the first the first time it's ever happened but i mean the biggest primary Mm -hmm. example of this right now to put out in front and thousands of people showed up at this rally in london and you know as geert wilder said take notice Theresa may take notice sadiq khan Take notice, we are the people. The power, the political power is with us. And what you're doing is not what the people want. And basically, how long can that ever persist? 
using history as our guide, that never persists forever, right? If the if the gulf between what the people want and what the leaders are doing becomes too big, mm-hmm. then the people tend to revolt. Absolutely. So, and I think that's essentially what he was saying. Now, I don't think he was threatening revolution. He's just saying, take notice. Mm-hmm. Don't, as a leader of these people, you can't go against everything that we want and expect us to support you. It makes good sense to me. So go out there and watch, if you can, Gert Wilder's speech in London. It's only about 10 minutes long. Um, I'm going to change my name pronunciation. Yeah? Roxanne Wilder. <laughs> well, you it's know how... It's spelled I, the same, it's, except his has an You know how I have Geert to... Vil, he, he's Gert Wilder. i got to say everything funny, but mm-hmm. that is the correct right. Dutch mm-hmm. pronunciation would be Gert Wilders. So, of course, I have to try to say it that way. Because I'm very hoity-toity. Because I'm British. So <laughs> you just I have want to, to be on point with your right, pronunciation. I'm British. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we come back, we got a local interest story that will that'll literally uh, tear your arm off, uh, scare you maybe, those of us that hang around the lakes and things here in Florida, and we know those gators, I mean, they're harmless, aren't they? Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe not so much. And then we got an FBI agent backflipping on the dance floor we were going to tell you about last week. All that when we come back on The Morgan Streetman Show. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. Pat George has put some video up on in our room here in our studio that I'm really excited to share with everyone. We're going to get to that in just a moment. I've watched it like 10 times now. It's that good. It's well, worth watching. I mean, you know, we, we, we've got two great stories, so maybe mm-hmm. we want to just go with that one okay, first okay. Because, the, because you're in the mood right now. I'm in the we, mood. You've just come right. off a laughing You're going to take me down if we go with the other story. So this is a good news. This is a bad news story, too, but it's kind of hilarious when you see the video. An FBI agent was at a, was this a nightclub? Yeah. Or an outdoor like a, night? It kind of looks, kind of like a bar. Right. And about so, 1.30 in the morning. What time was it, Pat? One thirty. I bet it was. And this happened in Denver. In Denver. And so he's an FBI agent. He's on the dance floor. These moves. He's busting some moves he, now. Uh, well, he's got a whole crowd around him. So he'd drawn some, quite a bit of attention. And then he drew fire accidentally. <laughs> the gun flew out of his pants while he was in mid backflip, one of his dance moves. And the gun discharged. So it fired and he picked it up and acted like, oh, nothing to see here. Don't get all worked up. I'm just doing some dance moves. And my gun just went off. Yeah, Pat, exactly how much tequila do you have to drink to get your knees to move like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot. <laughs> More than you've ever had, right? Exactly. And I've never done that. I mean, this guy, boy, he was loosened up. Let's just say he was loosened up. And and what what point do you get to? I mean, I know that when you're an FBI agent, it still doesn't mean that you can't go out to social events and still have a good time. I know you're hmm. still a human being. But I mean, this guy's taking the dance floor. You, it just seems like if you're an FBI agent, you just want to be a little bit more low key in your goings on in life. That's, That's just right. my thought. He was dancing to "I Shot the Sheriff." <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, he was undercover as like a club kid or something. I don't know. I mean, yeah. at what point do you just leave your your pistol in the car when you're going in? At one thirty in the morning to the you bar, do a backflip and not have the foresight to say, you know what? I better. <laughs> I better can adjust better. my pants before oh, I do well, my I thought practice. it was illegal to take a gun into a place of alcohol. A restaurant's one thing, but a bar's another. You're exactly right. It certainly is. Now, there may be some different rule for FBI agents. Well, there may be some different rules in Colorado altogether because you can be high <laughs> everywhere, so you can't have guns everywhere. Well, one thing I will say is that considering that the FBI is always going on television lately telling us mm-hmm. what a storied institution they are and how... Um, you know, important they are to the maintenance of our our republic, or they would probably want to call it our democracy. Um, you know, I mean, they really need to up their game a little bit. They need to get a hold of these young agents and, and teach them, um, I don't know, common sense, maybe? Because mm-hmm. common sense would tell me that, one, if I got a firearm in, in my back, in the mm-hmm. small of my back, I'm just not going to do a backflip. Or let somebody hold the gun while you do that. I mean, goodness gracious, why do you even take the gun into the bar? Probably mm-hmm. just to show off. Hey, check it out, baby. I'm an FBI agent. You want to see my pistol? 
Uh, I don't know, but it's wrong. It's wrong. It's an ego problem. And I'll tell you what, this guy fired it. The gun didn't go off when it hit the ground. This idiot, when he picked it up, actually fired his own weapon. He put his finger in the trigger. He put his finger in the trigger and pulled the dang trigger. You know, he shot somebody in the leg. Yeah, he did. So we're making jokes about it. I'm laughing it's at not funny. dance moves. But he did shoot someone, this, this gentleman named Thomas Reddington. He was at Mile High Spirits Distillery. At the bar early Saturday morning, and all of a sudden he felt his leg. He says he saw some brown residue on his leg, and he's thinking a firework had gone off. And then he starts to black out. And mm. so he's going in and out of consciousness, basically. And next thing you know, he, he woke up and a paramedic was putting a tourniquet around his leg. And I'll tell you, I watched the news reports on that. And they acted like, oh, he's going to be fine, though. Everything's going to be fine. It's just fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if some other random mm-hmm. non-FBI agent exactly. did this. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't just be, oh, he's going to be fine. Knock it off. It's just like a, it's like a mosquito bite. It's like got mm-hmm. stung by a bee, really. Mm-hmm. Really nothing. No, this guy shot him in a bar. That's a big deal. So right, hopefully, right. hopefully this agent gets uh, terminated because mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you can't make a mistake like this and um, hope to, you know, right the ship and bring your career back. No. no, I think if you've done something like this, it's time to just hang it up. It's time to go work somewhere else. You're not cut you lost out. Your ch- you, you lost your chance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you frankly, you've never deserved it in the first place, obviously. But now that we know that, we certainly aren't giving you a second one. Well, some people lose their I, I know some people who've gone through the screening to become an FBI agent. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very difficult, as it should be, to become an FBI agent. It's a meticulous, intensive process. The investigation, the lie detector test, all the background stuff they do on you. And so I know someone who applied and he didn't get in. So this guy applied and got in, and now he just got out. Is right, my, is, right. I'm, I'm with you, Morgan. Yes. Well, deservedly so. Well, um, you know, something that really probably wasn't deserved and really kind of shocked me. I, I mean, I, I grew up here in Florida, and I always believed that alligators were essentially harmless. No, not at all. Uh, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, no, no, I'm serious, y'all. I mean, not crocodiles, and we've talked about this before, but crocodiles, those I'm scared of. We, we, I've been to Costa Rica. You can see those in the water. They'll definitely kill you. They'll come after you like your prey and kill mm-hmm. you. But alligators in Florida have always kind of kept their distance and they're kind of docile. And, you know, you can even swim sort of with them. You don't obviously want to go over and try to pet them. But, you know, the fact that they're in a lake where you're swimming is not usually, you know, a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, apparently over in Davie, Florida, we had the situation where they know about this large, rather large gator that is in a lake and and has apparently previously taken some people's pets taking some dogs and cats and things like that that it's been able to get a hold of. And this is over at the Silver Lakes Rotary Nature Park. Well, what happened this past weekend that was pretty shocking is a lady was walking her dogs there, and apparently there's a man who's frequently at that park, and I couldn't tell if he's, you know, sort of maybe sort of homeless or what. But anyway, he's always at the park, apparently. And he was also there kind of walking the opposite direction of this lady with her two dogs, And as he kind of came back around the circle and would have been meeting back up with the lady, he just came across her two dogs kind of jogging along Mm -hmm. with their leashes. Mm -hmm. And one of the dogs was kind of limping along and appeared to be injured. So they don't know what's been going on, but they're making the assumption that this lady was walking her dogs and maybe let one of them go down near the water to go to the bathroom or something. The gator might have come out and gotten that one and that she went in maybe, and this is all supposition because nobody saw anything, but that she went in to defend her dog. Maybe the gator, instead of latching onto the dog, then turned and latched onto her because what they found inside the gator is an arm. Mm -hmm. Probably leaned down to grab the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And so, you know. And got um, pulled in. Mm Mm-hmm. We know the lady's name. We're not going to share it. There's no reason to. It doesn't matter for the story or anything like that. She was 47 years old, though. Very sad story. Oh, very much um, so. You know, did what any of us would do, I'm sure. Uh, you know, if they got a hold of one of my dogs, I mean, I'd be right in there pounding them on the head. And, uh, you know. She attended a meeting two days earlier. They said, be careful along the lake because they saw a six-foot gator. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So this is, you know, um, something that we're going to have to be mm-hmm. be aware of now. We've got a lot more alligators in Florida than we've ever had before because uh, making them protected. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's maybe even possible we could take them off of protected status. Well, you know what else with the alligators? 
is they, you know, you can't ever feed them. And there are people who feed alligators. Oh, and so yeah. it's like with any wild animal, when you start to associate, when they associate food with humans, well, anything's fair game. That is so true. And, Caller and, just said they found her body, and I think you guys know that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Was it in the lake? I didn't catch. I mean, the last I heard. Just found her arm, and then the body was okay, recovered. Okay, So it, it was probably in the lake. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's generally what, you know, those large reptiles do, is they take you and, and hide you down at the bottom of the lake. When I was a police officer, um, there was a body that was tossed off I-75. It was a murder. Mm-hmm. Toss, tossed off the interstate before I-75 was a big deal to you, so it was mm-hmm. way up in Hillsborough State Park. We searched and searched and found the body in the river, mm-hmm. and there was an alligator guarding it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. not yet, but it was right at the mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and it's gross to just kind of think about, but, uh, but speaking of the Hillsborough River, boy, if you, go, if you go canoeing in that thing, which I've done. There's some big ones oh, on the bank. No, <laughs> you'll come around the corner, and you'll be like three feet from a 10 or 12-foot alligator. Mm. I'm not kidding you. Sitting no, up on the are bank. You serious? And it's just like, oh, he- hello. <gasps> it looks like a big fallen tree. Yeah. 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 Scary. And, and literally, there are bends in, in the Hillsborough he- River, so you come around the corner, and it ah. You know what is so terrifying with gators, but you they're you're safe, uh-huh. but you can get right up close to them. Is when you go to Bush Gardens. Yeah. Is that not the scariest thing when you go up and right when you walk into Bush Gardens, as you as you're getting through, I forget all the different lands, but there's the the gator pit, and you see all these gators, and right. I mean they're just a you know a fence away from you. It is kind of a freaky little it, it gator is. pit, yeah. a short fence, right? A short <laughs> fence. I know, and but they all seem pretty docile. They say they're drinking the beer over there too. They're just kind of <laughs> chill. Mm-hmm. They get they they feed them nachos and and uh, and beer, so mm-hmm. they're they're happy. They're good. Yeah. Well, you know, we got so many other things coming up this week. This is supposed to be one of the biggest weeks in news history. I'm mm-hmm. hearing. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got the North Korean summit going on in Singapore tomorrow, uh, as well as the Inspector General report that's about to come out later this week. So we'll catch you up on some of that. And boy, here's a story that we, uh, I mean, I don't know if you heard about this one, but how would you like to go into your hotel room when you're on a little trip and there's a suitcase in there? And you think, oh, that's nice of them. They brought me some stuff. And you open up the suitcase and it's full of jewels. It's full of millions of dollars of jewels. How'd you like that? I want to go on that Sounds vacation. Like a yeah, where where can I get? Mm-hmm. I, I, I need a suitcase full of jewels myself. I need it. We're going to tell you about how those were given away to people in our own government, and they never said anything about it. They never mentioned the fact that they got suitcases of jewels. Can you believe that? When we come back, Morgan Freeman Show. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. Roxanne Wilder with you. Pat George is here. If you want to be a part of the show, 888-404-1010. And we have a lovely studio audience. You may have heard one of those sweet voices when Pat George did his traffic report. That's right. We're Ooh, so pleased job. to have everybody here today. Mm-hmm. And we've got a lot to talk about. What is her name again? Cordelia. 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 Isn't that a pretty Cordy. name? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. You know, she's real excited because, you know, we replay this at five o'clock. Yes. Right? So she's going home to call her friends and say, Listen to me. I'm mm-hmm. on the radio. I'm on the radio. Absolutely. There you go. And you know what? I, she's actually going to be potentially a media superstar one day. Because, you know, when I got to doing those Periscope videos, uh, I think it was last year when there was that hurricane, remember? And I was doing all those Periscope videos. And she actually started doing her own Periscope videos. Aww. Yeah. So, you know, this could, well, mm-hmm. this could well lead over into the Cordelia Streetman show. Yes, That could be the next Mm -hmm. hot thing, you know? This is the launch point. All I got to do is get her a microphone. Mm -hmm. She'll be set. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show. Thank you. There you go. Wow. (laughs) Hang on to that one. Well, like I said, we got so much to talk about. You know, we came out of the G7 meeting or the G6 plus one, as Trump's calling it, maybe, which, as he mentioned, used to be the G8 because Russia used to be uh, allowed to be a part of it. But then... Mm -hmm. Basically, I think it was us that booted Russia out. Um, in any event, uh, you know, that kind of fell apart, it seems like, at the end. But now he's heading over to – well, he's already in Singapore, so he's getting ready to do this summit. And, of course, Singapore is 12 hours ahead of us. So the summit will be effectively tomorrow morning, the 12th, in Singapore. But that's going to put it at about 930 tonight. 
that the summit's actually going to start. And remember, Trump says he'll know within five minutes whether anything good is going to happen there. And he also said that if he doesn't feel like anything good is going to happen, there's no reason to waste everybody's time. The art of the deal. Yeah. The art of the deal. So he may yet do a takeaway play, you know, where he doesn't stay very long. We'll just have to see. But it's certainly going to be an interesting one. Well, it's 1230 there right now in the morning. So do you think everybody's back in their room or maybe – Someone's still out partying. <laughs> and I don't think it's Trump. Well, I, I think the FBI agents are currently at the clubs doing backflips, right? <laughs> Secret Service, uh-huh. maybe. Uh-huh. We, we don't even want to go there because if you think the FBI is bad, don't, don't mm-hmm. get into looking at what some of the things the Secret Service agents have done. I was so irritated because I clicked on to one of the websites that just has all the news coming in. And the big headline was, why Trump backed out of the summit, the real reason. So, of course, you click it because you think they're referring to today to the Singapore summit. Sure. But it was to the G7. Oh, you know, the, the news media. So irresponsible. Like at, just to get more clicks, they're going to put the headline that tricks you. That is mm-hmm. totally not a representation of what the story is about. Well, you know, and like Mason and the Sarge were focusing on, these people, they actually want the entire country to fail just so they could be proved right that Trump is such a horrible person and mm-hmm. never should have been president. Mm-hmm. So at this point, they're just hoping because actually what's happened is he's done a pretty good job. They're just saying, oh, gosh, now we hope the whole thing fails so that you can see you you deplorable idiots, you, you middle America, stupid people who like your thousand dollars extra money a year that you didn't have to pay in taxes. You little people. We're going to show you how right we were that you should have voted for Hillary Clinton because we're going to make sure that the whole thing goes down. The whole ship goes down just because we don't like the captain. That's pretty darn selfish. A very selfish. Immature mm-hmm. and um, and stupid, frankly. So I just can't wait to see what's in this DOJ Inspector General's report that's supposed to be coming out on Thursday. Um, I don't like the fact that it's coming out on Thursday because that gives you a shortened uh, news cycle because, of course, every week they restart from scratch they erase the uh chalkboard and pretend like nothing ever happened before and we just Mm -hmm. start over with whatever the next week's stories are but that's one to really focus on i think we're going to have some stuff to talk about next week on monday when that inspector general's report has already come out and we've had a chance to kind of analyze it some of the leaks that we've heard are are somewhat juicy Mm -hmm. of course not telling us anything we didn't already know like comey was insubordinate big surprise there isn't this about two weeks late now yeah, it's running – you're exactly right, Pat George. It's running late, and there are competing theories on why it's running late. Well, you know, One was that they were giving people who were criticized in the report extra time to prepare a written response. Then the other theory has been that actually Rod Rosenstein is trying to go through and, and shave off any sharp points in the report that criticize the Department of Justice or the FBI too sharply or too directly – And he's trying to shave those off because, as they all like to say, I'm an institutionalist. I believe in the institution of the Department of Justice. Um, You know, I guess no matter what it does, I mean, is that what you're saying? Like the the Department of Justice could be totally co-opted and become, you know, like the East German Stasi or something. And it doesn't matter because you're an institutionalist, so you're going to support whatever they do. Or are you a person who has principles and values and, and it matters what they do? So. I, I got a real problem with uh, if they are changing the report, but my gut is knowing the way Horowitz has operated that if they shave too much off of it, there'll be a way that that still comes out because he seems to be focused on transparency. And, um, you know, I think the American people need to know the truth here. There is so much uh, underhanded stuff that's gone on, so much smoke. There are fires. We need to know what all's happened. And then the people who are responsible and who have broken the law need to be brought to justice. And I'm including in that all the people who co-opted the Department of Justice and our intelligence services and planted spies in a presidential campaign. There's no excuse for that. There's This is not normal. This doesn't happen all the time. This is a real serious crime. It's the most serious crime that we've heard about in recent memory in our in our government. And uh, and we need to look into it. We need to get to the bottom of it and hold people accountable. Speaking of another crime in our government, you know, Ben Rhodes, you know, remember that name from the Obama administration? He was one of Obama's primary speech writers. He's just put out a book. And in his book, he's come out and he said what I was kind of alluding to earlier. And by the way, the book is called The World As It Is. So no 
no veneer of uh, politeness put onto this. This so, is just the world as it is. So what is his angle? Overall? Well, his angle was that in June 2009, when remember when they went on the Muslim apology tour, starting out in Saudi Arabia and then mm-hmm. went to Cairo and Obama made that big speech, uh, you know, saying that, you know, Islam – basically just saying good things about Islam, and it was kind of his beginning of his apology tour. Remember, when he met the uh, Saudi king, he bowed over at the waist, and it was a huge deal because we in America don't believe in those types of things like monarchy and stuff, and we don't believe in subjecting ourselves to them, so we don't bow to kings in America. But apparently our president does. Well, now we know why. Now we know why. Because as Ben Rhodes reported in his book, rather nonchalantly, I would say, And his book, again, The World As It Is. So you just have to understand, this is just the way the world works. Ben Rhodes said that when he arrived in Saudi Arabia, he was taken to his uh, housing compound and shown his room. When he opened the door to his room... Just to interrupt. So Ben, obviously, is a great supporter of Obama and his policies. Well, sure. So this is just him speaking candidly about what he observed. Well, yeah. I mean, I I think he doesn't really see anything wrong with it. I, I think he doesn't realize what's actually occurred here. Okay. Okay, but he says when he opened the door to his unit, he found a large suitcase, and inside the suitcase were jewels. And so he says, well, you know, initially, I thought they put this bag of treasure in my hotel room to bribe me. <laughs> Somebody promote this guy. This guy, This guy. maybe he, he should be Inspector together. General. I mean, what a genius there. <laughs> so that's what he thought. But then he realized, right, because, you know, he's thinking so deeply about this. He realized that he wasn't the only member of the Obama delegation to have received this bag of jewels, that actually everybody got a suitcase of jewels in their hotel room. Now, that makes it not a bribe, obviously, because everybody gets it. So obviously they weren't just trying to influence him. They were just they're just they're just generous people. What I want to know is where's my suitcase of jewels? How come these generous people didn't give me a suitcase of jewels or you a suitcase of jewels? Okay, I think you're smart enough, folks, to know the answer to that question, because this wasn't just generosity. This was buying Mm -hmm. favor. Mm -hmm. Now, what's important is we don't influence policy. That's why we didn't get those jewels. Right. Exactly. What's important is jewels are not traceable. They never reported them as gifts on their income taxes. Those jewels don't technically belong to them because they're not there in their individual capacity. They're there as our representatives of the United States government. And as Mason and the Sarge rightly pointed out, presents that are given to our president don't belong to him individually. They belong to our country. You know, who paid for the gas in Air Force One for him to fly over there? It was me and you folks. So how come he gets to put all the jewels in his personal safe Mm -hmm. like he was over there by himself doing his own thing? If he wants to go over there by himself, not as president, take the jewels. You better report it to the IRS. But beyond that, take them. But if you're there as the representative of our country, those are our jewels. It should have been reported. Those should have been added somehow to our national collection of presents that presidents have received. But they weren't. I'd like to know what they did with the jewels. I'd like to know how much money Rhodes got from selling those jewels or whatever he did with them. I mean, that to me... You know, for for a bunch of people that like to run around and say that they didn't have a single scandal in the entire eight years President Obama was president. I mean, they sure are. They sure are missing quite a few, aren't they? I mean, to me, this is a huge scandal. And again, they just so nonchalant about it and enabled by the media who doesn't make a huge deal about it. You know, you, you have to go over to like the Gateway Pundit just to get somebody actually talking about this. So speaking of other governments doing things that maybe their people don't like. You know, we've seen in Italy, and we told you some about this week, kind of a revolution among the populace because they're so fed up with all of the immigration and the Muslim migration from North Africa. And now we've got the country of Austria actually themselves are getting ready to to throw out a bunch of Turkish imams out of their country. And basically the new Austrian president who is, you know, very right wing, Sebastian Kurtz. He said that parallel societies and political Islam and radicalization have no place in our country. Now, this is Austria. Okay, it's right next to Germany. We're not talking about Australia, Austria. And they're throwing out up to 60 Turkish funded imams and closing about half a dozen um, mosques 
in Austria because they're not going to put up with this radicalization anymore. And, of course, this is what the European people want. They want Europe to stay Europe. They don't want it to turn into North Africa or another Muslim society. And if you think that's not happening here, folks, you really need to look into things because we have a whole slew of stories where these things are going on right here in our very own country. You know, we told you about those folks in Indonesia about a month ago or maybe six weeks ago now blowing themselves up, the whole family, killing a bunch of people and injuring a bunch of people. Where do you think this comes from? Why do you think they do this stuff? Because they're being brainwashed into believing that it's their obligation under their religion. And I got a question for you. Why are we doing this to our U.S. school children? Why are we brainwashing our very own school children with the same kinds of indoctrination? And we got some real stories because this is really going on right now in U.S. schools. And if you don't know about it, you should know about it. So we're going to cover that when we come back. And then we're going to go out there on The Morgan Streetman Show. Welcome back to the Morgan Streetman Show, otherwise known as my uncle. <laughs> wow, that is just too cute. She nailed it. That is just too cute. And we're going to have to get Cordy. that one on a uh, promo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, before we get into the out there segment, I wanted to finish up the thought that I was having because, you know, we're looking around the world and we're seeing what happens when people... Um, become radicalized in islam and of course we've had guests on that have suggested to us hey it's not so much that they're becoming radicalized it's that they're getting it accurately so it's not radicalized islam it's just islam and you know we're, i don't think that's an issue we have to decide right here today if that's the case or not the case what i think is important is we need to be careful with this whole thing of islam because what happens to people when they do get involved in it, a large degree of them do become radicalized. That much we can agree on. And and there is this vein of, uh, you know, theology in Islam about the idea of jihad and that being an actual physical struggle where you go and fight against the infidels. OK, so this is a big deal. This catches a lot of people. They say up to 10 percent of Muslims worldwide. And since there's over a billion of them worldwide, you're talking about over 100 million people who are, quote unquote, radicalized. That's a pretty large population. But now what are we doing with our school kids? Now, compare and contrast what we allow teachers to teach about or say about, for example, oh, Christianity. OK, not much, right? We don't want to hear the name Jesus mentioned anywhere in school. In fact, we're going to make it up. We're going to say that you can't even mention that name in school, even though that's not what the First Amendment says. And that's not what religious freedom actually means. That's the way the schools tend to apply things. But you notice they don't do that with Islam. They treat Islam totally differently. And this is going on right now, and it is funded and supervised and pushed on our schools by our very own U.S. Department of Education. So this is what our tax dollars, our own tax dollars, are going towards. And you tell me that we're so much different than what's going on in Britain and these other European countries. And I say we're not. I say we're just a few years behind them. We're following their exact model here. And folks, if we don't wake up and stop it, we're going to wind up where they have wound up. Is that where you want to live? Is that how you want to live? You tell me. It's not how I want to live, and it's not America. But let's tell you about these specific stories, okay? Because this is important. In Virginia, and this came out just last year, so this is the curriculum that's in place right now, okay? It's the U.S. Department of Education's uh, program called, quote, Access Islam, okay? And here's what they're doing in that program. Just to give you a little idea, because just just imagine if they did something like this with Christianity or Judaism or, or some other religion. The parents would be so up in arms. They're literally making lesson plans where the kids have to learn the five pillars of Islam. Okay, they have potentially as many as four one-hour classes on this. They've got to make posters. They've got to put them up around the school. This way... They can share with other non-Muslim students what it means to be a Muslim. Well, I'm sorry. Why do they need to know so much of the details? I mean, it includes things like making them 
learn, and you have to imagine as you're learning it, you're going to be reciting it, okay? And that's the Shahada. Now, if you know what that is, saying the Shahada is the only thing that you ever have to do to become a Muslim. If you say the Shahada and believe it, you are considered a Muslim, period, the end. So that is their act of faith, and here we are force-feeding it to our students in grades 5 through 12. Now, do you imagine some of them are going to wind up just saying it to themselves or saying it to other people? I imagine that they are. And what does that mean? Does it mean that they're Muslim? I don't know. I wouldn't think so. But why in the world are we taking time out of school to teach kids so much detail about this particular religion? I mean, exactly how, what percentage of the U.S. population is Muslim? I bet you it's a percent or less. It's not a huge population. But we're going to take three hours or four hours of class time to learn about this. And again, folks, just contrast it to what would happen if this was Christianity. What would happen? Or Judaism. Or Judaism. What would happen if we said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to sit you down and you're going to memorize key concepts from the Sermon on the Mount. And you're going to be able to recite what it means to be saved by grace and, and what the biblical basis of Christianity is or something like that. I mean, parents would be furious. And the first group that would probably come out would be the atheists that right. would come out. Of course. And where are they now? Where are they now? Right. Where are they now? Now, in West Virginia, this is this is really timely, okay, because in West Virginia, we know we're just now coming to the end of Ramadan. In fact, it ends on uh, Wednesday or Thursday of this week. So in West Virginia, they actually have told the teachers that they should encourage their students to try fasting. Now, remember, fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam, okay? Well, you may not know that because I didn't tell you that earlier, but you might know that. That is one of the five pillars. So now in West Virginia... I mean, West Virginia, they're saying, hey, maybe you should try fasting during Ramadan so you can learn what it <laughs> means to be a Muslim. I'd already fail. Oh, it's great. <laughs> Pat they George know, brought me a McDonald's. There ain't a lot of fasting going on in uh, West sausage Virginia. sausage biscuit this morning that was delicious. Thank you so much, Pat. We don't normally do that. But you guys, no. you we guys not are fasting. not following your Ramadan fast. And then a story out of what we think is Minnesota, and of course the exact location's been obscured except for they told us it's one of the places with a Muslim member of Congress. Well, there are only two states that have that, Minnesota and Indiana. So my money is on Minnesota. But they actually sent around these like Facebook messages to all the teachers saying, hi, Ramadan begins tonight. Celebrated by Muslims, it is the most sacred month of the year, characterized by the daily fast. Fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam, and fasting from dawn until dusk during Ramadan is required for all healthy Muslims who are of age. The purpose of the fast is to gain self-control, increase prayer, increase charity and generosity, blah, 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 blah. That sounds like a teacher from The Simpsons. <laughs> well, good. That's kind of what I'm shooting for. My point is they're pushing this stuff on these school children. They're pushing it on them. Hey, kids, you should try fasting. It's coming up on Ramadan, and you need to try out some of these five pillars of Islam. You need to, why don't you just try saying the Shahada? And, and why don't you just try fasting? Well, you're getting two of the pillars right there. I mean, go to Mecca, and you know, you, you pretty much nailed them all at that point. It doesn't make a lick of sense. There's no academic reason for that whatsoever. I find it offensive. Um, and, you know, it's just stupid. It's like shooting ourselves in the foot. We have got a problem with Islam or radical Islam, whatever you want to call it. But we've got a problem. It's a worldwide problem. And why are we trying to import that same civilization jihad type of attitude here and then indoctrinate our school children with it that doesn't make any sense at all unless we want to destroy ourselves we didn't even get to our out there this week we had a great one for you on rogue cell phone spying devices in our nation's capital we'll bring that one back to you next week i'm morgan streetman and that's the way i see it The views and opinions expressed on the preceding program were those of Morgan Streetman and are not those of Beasley Media Group, this station, its management, or other hosts or advertisers. Tampa Bay's business address is Money Talk 1010 AM and available on HD at 99.5 HD2. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Money Talk 1010 AM.
Tampa Bay's Business Address.